refuse to tell parents what's going on in the classroom is coming under fire. Can we rely on them to get it right? Or is it time to inspect the inspectors? Somewhere in these empty classrooms, a five-year-old boy is having a lesson. He's all alone, the only child in this school. Can I, my mommy got a like that. Does she? Does she have daffodils in it? No. Okay, now what are you going to start with? Do you miss other children? Yeah. What do you miss about it? They normally played with me when they were here. Mm. Do you wish other children were at this school yeah, like you? I did. Wish they were. The reason why Richard Marlin has a lesson all to himself, a visit from school inspectors. Mm. How could you make a really light green? What it's meant, a new teacher, and for the new head, a seemingly impossible task to turn this school around. Are you looking at the bars at the same time? In 1996, the school was inspected. All schools are inspected on a four-year cycle at the moment. This school, unfortunately, got into a situation where it was termed significant weakness. The inspectors' report on this school confirmed parents' worst fears. And last winter, when the primary was judged to be failing, there was a mass exodus of children. There was an explosion, a gut reaction that says, we're no longer prepared to accept what's happening to our children. We're going to do something about it. Unfortunately, instead of taking a little bit of time and standing back, they said, let's move our children, which unfortunately is what they did in December. You must have been very worried for your son. We were, because we didn't really know how far he was behind already. Um, and I mean, I really wanted him to stay at the school. And I had done for the the last 18 months. But it just got to a stage where we had to forget the building and think of our son. For parents, teachers and for children, when the inspectors call, it can be make or break. The stakes are high. And if Richard's to have friends at playtime, the new head here must convince the inspectors this school can be saved. He must draw up a plan of action for the future that revolves around just one child. One pupil, one teacher, one secretary, one midday meal supervisor. Now, it's obviously a very odd situation to be in. You've got a teacher all to yourself, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. And what's that like? It's, I n it's boring, because no one else is here to play with me. What's happened at this Norfolk primary school is a graphic example of the power of inspectors' reports. It's proof, too, of the impact of Ofsted, the school inspection body set up six years ago. Ofsted's aim is to tell parents what's really going on in classrooms, to publicise both successes and failures. But with so much riding on inspectors' reports, can we rely on Ofsted to get it right? The London headquarters of the Office for Standards in Education, an organisation that has a central role in shaping children's futures, the future of education in England and a body that this year will cost us, the taxpayer, £150 million. If our reports, one, identify the successful schools so that the schools, those schools get the credit, two, identify schools where problems have festered and where generations of children have suffered because those problems have not been brought out into the open, then that is enormously important. And thirdly, if parents are told what is happening in their schools, that too is a tremendous value for money achievement. <laughs> An Ofsted inspection probes every aspect of school life. Before they even arrive, a team of inspectors will have pored over data on a school's background, its pupils and their performance. 
But key to the whole process is the period of up to four days spent in the classroom observing lessons. This forms the major part of how inspectors arrive at their view of a school. Armed with observation sheets, they mark lessons on a seven-point scale, judging teaching, pupils' response, attainment and progress. The Adele Primary School in Leeds, and like many, the head here has no argument with the need for inspection, a public scrutiny of standards in classrooms. But a recent Ofsted visit here underlined his deep misgivings over whether the present system gives a fair picture of schools. Four days in a school isn't good enough. If your camera isn't focused and you're not pointing in the right direction, the snap isn't worth having. According to the head, inspectors popped into some lessons only briefly, and there were others where they failed to turn up at all. Some of the uh, judgments that they made were based on no visits at all, others of periods of five minutes, ten minutes, quarter of an hour, and I defy any inspector to evaluate the quality of teaching, the attainment level of a class of up to 30 pupils, the progress those pupils made in that lesson during that time, and validate those judgments. There was the bizarre case of the missing music lesson. Inspectors arriving at a grade for a non-existent class. One teacher was given a grade for the quality of teaching in music when she in fact, in fact had not taken the lesson. And this was some kind of slip, was it? One can only assume so. I brought it to the attention of the registered inspector and I would have expected a, an acknowledgement that a mistake had been made and a correction to have been issued, but none has been forthcoming. There has been no correction to that? There has been no correction. During the inspection, the school was criticised for not paying attention to teaching youngsters IT or computer skills. But on this occasion, with the help of a security camera, the school was able to show it was the inspectors who were not paying enough attention in the classroom. Though inspectors had seen IT work, the head used this video evidence to argue that they weren't as focused as they could have been on five- and six-year-olds' computer skills. Did you have to insist the inspector came to see a videotape? I did indeed. Um, it was an interesting experience because here I was challenging the report and being told that the judgment was secure. And after several approaches to the inspector, she eventually agreed to view this evidence and as a consequence the judgment was changed. But getting other changes to the final report proved an uphill struggle. Alan Patton challenged the inspectors on a number of points from a suggestion that it was too cold for PE to criticisms of science the head felt were at odds with children's achievements. You made lots of criticisms. Did they accept any of them? They accepted less than a handful. And when you consider that I made in excess of 50, one has got to say, if I was challenging reasonably the evidence, they should come back to me and say, I'm sorry, Mr. Patton, you are wrong, because, rather than give the bland, our judgments are secure, we provided evidence to show that these judgments were wrong. That evidence was not accepted. The final report did say that teaching here was a main strength of the school. But Mr. Patton has good reason to question other judgments for he himself is a trained Ofsted inspector. And he recently brought his practised eye to another report, this time into his daughter's school. I was outraged by the report because I knew this to be an excellent school served by excellent teachers. And when I read the report, I became aware of many inaccuracies. As an insider, I was aware of how the report was compiled. So I took up my pen and wrote to my MP and said, this is not fair. Among Mr Padden's many concerns, the point is for improvement in Ofsted speak, the key issues for action. These criticised financial planning and the teaching of art. 
In a subsequent letter, Chief Chris Woodhead revealed that an Ofsted monitoring unit had already picked up defects in the report. He admitted the key issues for action were seriously flawed. But the report hasn't been changed. It still remains a public document. I think it's outrageous. If we make mistakes, we've got to put our hands up and say, this was an error. No system is perfect. One doesn't pretend that any system could achieve everything. But this report system is achieving very little, and that report really wasn't fair to that school. Ofsted enters into contracts with inspectors to visit schools. It's only on very serious occasions that Ofsted overturns inspectors' findings. We can't change a report. Why because, not? Because we will then be second-guessing the uh, evidence and the experience of the inspectors. What we can do, and what I have done, is to offer a school re-inspection. As yet... You we think they'd welcome that, well, do you? As yet, we haven't been taken up on that. There is concern, though, isn't there, about your complaints procedure? Some teachers have told us that they feel as if Ofsted is acting as judge and jury. One of the things that we've done about our complaints procedure very recently is to bring in uh, an external body um, to preside over any complaint which has been investigated internally where the school isn't satisfied. Why didn't so you do that before? I mean, why well, is it taking so long? maybe we should have done. Maybe we should have done. Was that a mistake, do you think, not to I, have done I that? Think that? We I, would have reassured schools, wouldn't I think, it? I think that it is the right thing to do now, certainly. But there are further serious concerns about whether inspectors do get it right when it comes to judging standards in schools, pupils' achievements. Parents anxious to check up on their children's primary schools don't just have to rely on Ofsted reports. There's another independent measure of how well schools are doing. SATs tests, tests in maths, English and science. The problem is, SATs results and inspectors' reports don't always tally. A school can get dismal SATs results and pass its Ofsted with flying colours. The Strand Junior School in Grimsby. The subject three years ago, not only of a glowing Ofsted report, but a visit from the BBC's flagship current affairs programme, Panorama. The school was inspected by Ofsted in March this year. 79 lessons were inspected over four days. Not one was failed. The BBC was full of praise for a school that had apparently triumphed over the odds. This boy couldn't read at eight years old at the school he was at before. Now he reads for pleasure. And it wasn't just the BBC who were impressed. Colin Richards is Ofsted's former specialist advisor on primary education. When he read the inspector's verdict on the school, he told us he got on the phone to his boss, Chris Woodhead. This was the best inspection report that had crossed my desk in six months. I thought this is so important that I really ought to go and see what makes this school such a good school considering the social problems that it faces. It was because of that that I decided to ask Chris Woodhead along as well. He said it was a marvellous school, didn't he? It was an Aladdin's cave of achievement. Yes, he did. I think those were the exact words. The Ofsted report called the Strand Junior an excellent school, where standards were in line with national expectations in English and maths. But in this Aladdin's cave, all was not as it seemed. The year after Ofsted came, the national SATs results here were dismal. An average of only 11% of children reached levels expected of 11-year-olds. And when this came to light, there was publicity of a less welcome kind in the national and local press. The head of the school was challenged over the poor results. Would you not have felt more comfortable, though, in a sense, if there had have been an inquiry? I myself rang Ofsted and offered to open the doors to a second inspection there and then. Really? Yes. Why did you do that? Because you were so concerned? Well, people, uh, because of the articles in newspapers, began to doubt the inspection report. Now, as I said, they're, they're two different things. And I have absolutely no doubts that uh, uh, the inspectors saw an honest school. This is baffling for parents. I mean, what should they believe? In your view, a flawed Ofsted report, or in your view, flawed SATS results? Well, in my judgment, they should believe neither. So what uh, should they do? My view, in the short term, it's very difficult to know what they can do. What we need to do is to 
both improve the reliability and validity of SAT testing on the one hand, and we need to improve the inspection system on the other. And until we do both, then, it's, then it, parents are exactly in that problematic situation you described. Baydock's Wood Primary School in Bristol. And here, a very different story. Five months ago, Ofsted judged this school to be failing. But in the same year, in SATS tests, an average of half the 11-year-olds here achieved national standards. And over the last three years, results both at seven, what's called Key Stage 1, and 11, Key Stage 2, have been getting better and better. In the three years that the school has been open, each year we've had a steady improvement year on year in both Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 SAT results. And given the social problems here in Southmead, the local education chief says children have made huge strides. It's very socially deprived as a, as a community. Uh, some families are on the third generation of unemployment, so teachers find it harder to bring children to learning in the morning. So what then did you make of the Ofsted report? Well, it made us think that they hadn't taken into account properly the progress that the children had been making, and which means also perhaps they hadn't taken into account exactly the low levels of attainment of the children at the ages of four and the ages of seven when they were in, entering the school. Inspectors were critical of standards of attainment, of teaching and of management. The school was put on something called special measures. This means they face a period of intense scrutiny and another inspection in the future. The head says staff morale is now at an all-time low. It must have been a terrible blow. It's like a bereavement in the family. It's so debilitating and exhausting for people. I'm in fear of losing many of my key members of staff, and indeed several people have already left the school. But what's particularly galling for staff here is that this school is one of the pioneers for Labour's new back-to-basics idea. They're one of the schools piloting the government's literacy drive. An hour a day is spent on reading and writing, and the children are enthusiastic about what they've been learning. What kind of things I do is uh, like reading and writing, but I mostly do definitions. Whenever I had like an hour and we had reading and that, you wouldn't be quite learning much except just words and that. But with this literacy hour thing, we've um, learned more than we normally used to. To add to the bitterness felt here about the Ofsted report, a further irony. Eight months before the Ofsted inspection, Another group of government inspectors visited this school to check up on the literacy scheme, and there was praise for what the school was achieving. Her Majesty's inspectors, when they came in to monitor the literacy hour, used the word impressive, and they were fully behind us. But on the other hand, the Ofsted inspection team, which is also part of the same government organisation, come in and say things like, uh, it's a snapshot of where your school is now and we are not taking um, the literacy hour into consideration because it's not part of national developments at the moment. But it is now. But it is now. Some parents simply can't square the Ofsted report with what they know about their school. I'm a teacher myself so and I happen to be a little bit nosy so I have come into more than one classroom and I've seen the work and I find it very impressive. As far as I was concerned, this was not our school. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they were um, when they did the report, but they weren't here. Mm. The children come home and they are so disappointed to, to think that they have been failed. They can't grasp it like an adult would. They just think it's either good or bad. And everybody has been telling them that they're bad. We feel that we've climbed a mountain only to be told that the summit is miles away. Back in London, Chris Woodhead told us Ofsted was investigating discrepancies between SATS results and inspectors' reports. It's a bit baffling for parents, isn't it, when they see an excellent Ofsted report in a school and then three years, for three years afterwards, there are dismal SATS results. I mean, what are they supposed to think? 
if um, that is the case, that is an issue that we would wish to investigate. So can I get this right? Are you saying on this programme that you are going to investigate discrepancies between Ofsted reports on the one hand and SATS examination results on the other? It is an issue that we are investigating at present and we will continue to investigate. But I'm also saying to you on this programme that it is not an issue that causes me uh, concern about the validity and reliability of the inspection process. It causes other people concern, doesn't it? Well, we have many critics who are concerned about many aspects of what we do. Colin Richards is one of those critics. He told us he believes the Ofsted inspection system has damaged schools. I would have said that a significant minority of primary schools did not get the inspection they deserved. And therefore, in a sense, a sen they have every right to feel a sense of injustice. Still feel a sense of injustice about that? Yes, because they had to live with the results of those early inspections. It's, it's at least four years before they get a second inspection. And during that time, I think their morale and their standing in the community might well have been adversely affected. Professor Carol Fitzgibbon is an academic and found a member of a pressure group called Ofsted, set up to monitor Ofsted. She's made a detailed study of the organisation and is highly critical of the way the inspection system works. They're inaccurate. And because they're inaccurate, they're unfair and it's a waste of money because they praise schools and people that maybe are no better than anybody else and they uh, fail to miss failures and they uh, describe as failures people who are in no way failing. Professor Fitzgibbon has examined recent Ofsted research into how reliable inspectors' judgments are. One of the aims of this Ofsted survey to see how often two inspectors watching the same lesson arrived at the same grade. They only agreed 66% of the time on their judgments of individual teachers. If two people sitting in a room watching the same lesson can't agree on a rating, what's the rating worth? But rather than concentrating on the one-third of inspectors who couldn't agree, the Ofsted line that 66%, two-thirds could. But critics of the report point out that the inspectors who took part in this Ofsted survey volunteered for the exercise and many had worked together before. These inspectors were volunteers. A third worked together sometimes, a third worked together often. The odds were stacked in Ofsted's favour, weren't they? Not at all. The, these well, why not? Are, not at all. I these mean, they are, knew each other. These are, these are two individuals uh, sitting in a lesson, judging independently. The validity of the judgments doesn't depend upon the prior familiarity of the inspectors. But whatever the debate about how reliable inspectors' judgments might be, there's little doubt of the continuing impact of the inspection system on schools. In part two, the story of a much-loved head teacher, Jean Valentine, who died two months ago. Will you stand up quietly, put your chairs on and stand behind your chairs. Some of you standing here have had a lot of her kindness towards you in ways that nobody else might know about, but you personally know about it. So would you bow your heads for 30 seconds and just put your mind on those good things that she's done? At a Liverpool school, children remember a popular head teacher, a crusader for her school, and a woman who will be missed by pupils and parents alike. She was a kind lady and she was funny.
she cares about children. If I had to say what I, where I want to go and what I want to do, she is just say, keep at it and you can do it. And it was the same with everybody. She was there for you and your children. Yeah. What more could you ask for? When the inspectors came here three years ago, they praised Jean Valentine for her strong leadership. A little over a week before her death, Jean received a letter putting her on notice of a second inspection. She hadn't dreamt Ofsted would be back so soon, and the news left her in a state of shock. Deeply upset, she shared her distress with her close family and colleagues. I heard from Jean uh, at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, ringing me at 11 o'clock at night, uh, being 40 minutes on the phone, I think is an indication of, of how worried Jean was. A few days after this phone call, Jean was admitted to hospital. She later died of a heart attack. The whole year there's been a lot of teachers off sick and so on, uh, and all that was adding pressure, and she was having to double up on timetables, and then you just get, as you sort of do, getting out of that problem, out of that wood, as it were, you get this letter slung at you, and you felt, oh my God, I'm back again to where I was. And I think it did have a devastating effect on her. In my opinion, the, um, the coming Ofsted inspection was the final straw. Jean had a difficult job, and that really, as I say, was my feeling that was the final straw. That was certainly felt by uh, other members of Jean's family when I spoke to them at the funeral. No one can say that the news of the inspection was a direct cause of Jean Valentine's death, but amongst her colleagues there's a sense of incomprehension at what's happened and great loss. To see a person on the prime of her life, in a sense, she was only 53 when she died, and there uh, was a, a hint of any illness, and then the next day, as it literally, she died. Um, you know, it's just something you, you just can't grump with. It's, uh, it knocks your confidence in everything. Broad Green Comprehensive, a few miles away from Jean Valentine's school, and here, too, they've been on the receiving end of a letter warning this school is to be re-inspected. When inspectors came here a year ago, for Head, Ian and Dane, it meant a period of huge upheaval and disruption. Ofsted maintained schools shouldn't have to put in extra time or money to prepare for an inspector's visit. But with a school's future hanging in the balance, many feel under pressure to do just that. Broad Green was refurbished, teachers here given extra training and staff spent months prior to the inspector's visit ensuring paperwork was up to date on everything from lesson plans to how the school was managed. To do all the documentation and the time and then all the, the paperwork involved and also, I have to say, to refurbish parts of the school, which we might not have done immediately prior to Ofsted, but cost well in excess of 15 to 20,000 pounds. The head here is now angry over his recent dealings with Ofsted, which he says have led to yet more stress and anxiety. Ofsted have admitted the initial letter they sent him about a reinspection was a mistake. What was your reaction when you heard you were about to have another Ofsted inspection? Probably being run over by a bus would have been preferable. Um, I couldn't believe it. I absolutely couldn't believe it when I opened the letter. Now, after the amazed response to begin with. Then, then I thought, it's not April the 1st. Then I thought, it's a mistake. Then I started laughing. It took me over two and a half weeks to get one person in Ofsted to admit that it was a mistake. And then another four or five days for a letter to be sent, which was miserly in terms of its apology, absolutely miserly, considering the angst that they put people through and then said, but of course, you could be inspected in the spring, or you will be inspected in the spring or the summer term of that academic year. Well, I mean, that's cold comfort. Ofsted says when they questioned schools, 90% of teachers told them they were broadly satisfied with their inspection. But we've done a survey of our own. We sent a questionnaire to 300 schools asking them what they thought of the present system. Of the 200 schools who replied, 95% told us the Ofsted model of inspection was the wrong one. 53% said they'd learnt nothing from the process. Ofsted has created a fearfulness in the system. 
at the level of the individual teacher, afraid of, of the intrusive nature of the inspection process, the level of the individual school, concerned about whether or not it will get a, an appropriate inspection. Tom Wiley is a former assistant director of inspection at Ofsted. He too has concerns at teachers' perceptions of the inspection process. There has been a sense over the last three or four years that Ofsted is out to get you, that it will ambush you if it can, that it won't give you a full and fair picture of your work as a school. I formally declare the Early Years Centre open. Birmingham Education Chief Tim Brickhouse at one of the city's schools. As vice chair of the government's task force on standards, he is an influential voice in the education debate, and he too has been an outspoken critic of Ofsted. You could have a teacher who's, who's really performing out of their skin on that day, uh, or you could equally have a teacher who, who is so fraught with the Ofsted process that they don't perform well. So there is a degree of unreliability both in interpreting the evidence and caused by the individual and their reaction to the circumstances. It's the time they spend in there and with you from birth till about seven will lay the foundations of their lives. And for Tim Brighouse believes Ofsted puts too much emphasis on judging schools, too little on supporting teachers. There is little doubt that the operation as it now stands means that a lot of schools do frankly regard it with an undue amount of fear and concern and trepidation and and for some people that 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 has caused ill health and it set a school backwards let the balloons go Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. are you concerned about Things that people have told us concerning stress that teachers feel as a result of an Ofsted inspection, fear, concern, trepidation are some of the words that's been used. Yes, I am concerned that teachers who have not had their schools inspected feel that the process is going to be acutely stressful. And it worries me that the media hype up the stress. Oh, we can't blame it all on the media, I surely. I think that the media representation of Ofsted inspections has not always, but often contributed to the fear that is felt in so some schools. So it's all our schools. fault? No, it's not all your fault. Obviously, the pressure of an inspection, it's real, and we can't deny that. What we can do is try by every means possible to render the process less stressful. But Ofsted not only plays a key role in teachers' futures and the futures of schools. The data and research they collect also helps inform government policy. And here too, Ofsted has been at the centre of controversy, with claims that findings have been manipulated and complaints that some reports have never seen the light of day. There was this, an Ofsted report into schooling in America. A team of senior inspectors investigated how authorities in the States dealt with failing schools. One of their conclusions, that rather than being a spur to improvement, publicly labelling schools as failing, appeared further to demoralise schools. The report was never published. I think the report should have been published because it is illuminating for the making of public policy. And, uh, uh, and an organisation which says it is independent should independently produce material without fear or favour. There was another row over this report into reading at 45 London primary schools. Ofsted's critics claimed the findings were slanted to mount an attack on teachers. They pointed to changes between early drafts of the report and the finished version. For example, in a draft, the quality of teaching of reading was satisfactory or better in approximately two-thirds of the lessons observed in year two. But in the final version, a change of tone. Weaknesses in teaching hampered pupils' progress and attainment in reading in one in three lessons in year two. Chris Woodhead says it's nonsense to suggest he personally rewrote this document. So why the fuss? Critics maintain when it comes to Ofsted's own research, the buck stops with the chief inspector. He is ultimately responsible for the operation of the total system and its reliability and for the advice which is offered to the public and to ministers on the back of that evidence. He's the only person equipped to say 
why some reports appear to take a different tone than they started and why some do never appear at all. Is it in your view to do with his influence on the institution? Well, he's the boss. He's the chief inspector. And I think institutions are very often made in the likenesses of those who lead them. You've been accused of manipulating data for political ends. What do you make of that charge? I take any complaint about Ofsted very seriously. Um, I do not take seriously accusations that simply do not stand up. So why, for example, did Ofsted not publish the report into schools in America? School we didn't publish the American report because we didn't think that it contributed anything very significant to the debate about education in England. Um, I am responsible to the Public Accounts Committee for the effective and efficient use of the public money that's invested in Ofsted. There are a number of surveys that we have conducted where we haven't published reports. There is nothing at all sinister in the fact that we didn't publish that particular report. A few weeks ago, Mr Woodhead produced this, his annual report, a key document on the state of schools in England. It makes a number of assertions about pupils' attainment, but the report contains no figures on inspectors' judgments to back up these statements. When Mr Woodhead came under fire recently at a House of Commons committee, one MP wants to know why important data on pupils' attainment was missing. I've read the entire report from cover to cover. I can't see a single piece of evidence in here about the attainments achieved by pupils as measured by your inspectors. Happily, dispatches can help out. We've acquired leaked papers which show the raw data used in compiling Mr Woodhead's annual report. In these documents, the missing figures on attainment. When inspectors look at a lesson, one of the key decisions they must make is about pupils' attainment. Our figures show that on the scale of 1 to 7, inspectors' judgments in primary schools are concentrated around the middle grades. Inspectors seem to find very little excellent or very poor attainment in schools. We showed this data to leading educational statistician Professor Harvey Goldstein. He told us that the way inspectors mark attainment raises serious questions about the Ofsted system. Either the scale is completely misconceived, either the inspectors are not properly trained to use all the points on the scale, and I think that's quite serious, or they do understand the issues but are, for whatever reason, very unwilling to use the extreme points on the scale. Whatever the explanation, it seems to me there is a real problem that Ofsted needs to face up to. Why is there no data in this report on attainment? Is it because, for example, inspectors' judgments on attainment were at odds with SAT's results? Is that the reason? No, it's not the reason at all. So, so why is there? Isn't there? The report is stuffed full of judgments about attainment. It's simply um, erroneous to say that there is no evidence of attainment in the annual report. But, but no data in the appendices, is there? The data in as, the as there is data for progress? There is data for progress for the reasons that I've just said. We've seen some of the raw data on attainment, and it suggests that inspectors' judgments bunch around the middle grade, so there's no excellent or, or very poor attainment in this country. Is there something wrong there? Um, no, I don't think that there is particular bunching. Uh, we keep... Well, there is in the data that we've well, seen. Well, I don't know what data you've well, seen, so I can't comment, can I? There we go. I mean, that, that's one... Well, you put this in front of me, I obviously would well, need to study it. Well, it's your own data, Yes, isn't I know, it? but I'd need to study it, wouldn't I? I can't comment on film. But what I would say to you with regard to the substantive issue, uh, I don't think that there is a particular problem with bunching around the midpoint. But if we need to assess the results that the scale is producing, we will do that. I mean, the, inf the inspection methodology is constantly under review. Of course, the difficulty with keeping it constantly under review is that if we do change things further, then we lay ourselves open to the accusation that we are changing the goalposts. But there is now a growing debate about how accountable the school inspection system is and calls for an independent inquiry into Ofsted. It doesn't have any kind of external scrutiny beyond the Select Committee for Education and Employment. I think it's rather paradoxical that a system which is designed to create better accountability and development in the education system as a whole seems so reluctant to be both accountable and developmental in its own processes. It's 
absolutely unsupportable for it to go on. I can't believe it's gone on this long. I can't believe it was ever allowed on the road without a safety check first. We've certainly got no secrets that we feel guilty about. So we are open to any kind of documentary inquiry, any kind of academic inquiry, any kind of inquiry that Parliament perhaps might want to throw at us. People need to have confidence in what is a major expenditure of public money. It would be timely um, for there to be an outside assessment of how well the organisation is doing. Back in Liverpool, Jean Valentine's school must prepare for another visit from Ofsted. But amongst Jean's former colleagues, fears about the effect of the inspection system and concern about what the future might hold. We'll see more and more of them going down with ill health. And it's going to be the good teachers that go and not rather the bad ones. Teachers like Jean Valentine? That's right, absolutely. She encouraged me to do well in everything, out in and outside school. She was a, she was a brilliant woman.